in essence, it'll be a, 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 a dog bone uh, because this was the only, in 1861, uh, the only double track that ran east and west was the section of track that ran in western Virginia. In fact, Jackson would bottle off the two locations uh, later in the war um, where they, they divided into two tracks, east and west, right. and then went back into single tracks, and that's where he pinched them off and captured uh, all these locomotives. Uh, so I'm actually modeling a, a double track. So the double track section or the main line actually is a, a giant 19-foot, uh, um, uh, basically a bone structure so that I can run a, a kind of a loop. And then, of course, from out of that main line, I'm in the process of then building all of the switches and, and, and putting together all the tracks that would make up the yard right. uh, and some of the industries along the way. Uh, as I mentioned the, the last time, uh, there's a distillery, there's several uh, mills, uh, there's a foundry and a machine shop. Um, so there's a variety of things. So right now I'm in the process of, of basically sketching out and compressing this huge map, which is actually about <coughs> about 40 foot long. Uh, once I taped it and glued it all together, so now I have to. But it's nice to have it laying on the floor in the basement, so you can kind of actually see. And then you look at it and go, well, I can take this chunk out, and then just switch everything over. And so then, it's, so I'm going back and forth to. I go over to the to the other end of the basement and I take some measurements and then I come back to any rail and I start. Uh, and and the neat thing about any rail is that they have all these uh, all templates you can download for creating yeah. yards and creating switches. So I don't have to spend hours and hours trying to figure out how to make all the track fit uh, because it, it it goes from two lines and splits out into to at times six um different tracks that uh were in the area so that's what i'm modeling so that's it's 1861 i had a debate that i did i do post burn it down or did i do pre burn it down and i've opted for the pre burn it down so i thought it would be a lot easier to build it all burnt down <laughs> so then i wouldn't have to do as much work it just you know these carcasses of <laughs> bricks but then I thought, nah, that was so. I got to do it. I've got to do it like June 1861, right. or after that, things start disappearing and things start getting destroyed. Because Martinsburg was occupied, uh, it changed hands about 37 different times during the Civil War. Wow. Um, and so, yeah, if you have a chance to, um, Mort Kunstler has uh, three different paintings that directly reflect Martinsburg. Right. One of them is actually the painting of Martinsburg and the. Uh, you that were with us at the Harper's Ferry, you could, the Berkeley Hotel is still there. A number of the structures uh, along the, not the uh, uh, roundhouse side of the track, but the other side of the track, a lot of those structures are still there, buried in weeds. Uh, so it's been real. So I have a whole photo library of all these buildings that are original to the Civil War. Um, so Question, that, Ron. Are you, yeah. are you planning on using flex track? Are you going to be hand laying? I've decided to hand lay it. Whoa. Yeah, I, I just, cool. I, I think the, the, the way I'm going to wrap the, the backdrop is so that the two loops in the, in the dog bone are actually, be, so they become staging yards. Uh, so I'll actually be able to Excellent. have some staging in those areas. And so I can bring trains on and bring trains off. But you know, I, I can also just turn them on and run them, uh, it. running in a loop uh, east and west. So uh, Good. Uh, that's, that's what I'm at. That's what I'm working on right now. And uh, uh, I'd had inter, inter, uh, any rail uh, and played with it a little bit, but DC mentioned it and, uh, the last time we were together, and it's like, why don't, I, why don't I just use this as I'm looking at the mapping on the floor? So it's an interesting, and the, the nice thing is, is I can actually get HO scale sizes for the buildings and figure out what buildings yeah. I want, where they want to fit, and the, yeah. the roundhouse for the 16-sided structure has a radius of 12 inches. Right. Uh, so it's all scale, so I can position things in. At some point, yeah. I, I sent you an email, Tom, with uh, some photographs and, and some of that uh, work uh, oh, that okay. I'm involved in. But that's kind of the, um, the what that I've could, been working on and, and where I'm at with everything. So that could be a uh, good article, man. That could be an interesting article. Appreciate all of the assistance from. All, I mean, all these people that I that I watch and John's like John. I spent lots of times at John Ott's uh, website. And, <laughs> Uh, so uh, just a, a, a great big thank you to all of you uh, uh, that I've managed to uh, look at your stuff and be in awe of. So thanks a lot. Cool.
So uh, I, I just want to say one thing about Andy because Andy got cut off, but uh, he's he's the one that's primarily responsible for my blog, uh, which I call Our Blog, and uh, he's done a lot of the videography and photography on the blog, and uh, he's been a real support uh, for all of us uh, for the last since we've been doing this practically. Hey, so Tom, can you, can you hear me now? Yay, Joel. I'm using my iPhone, so uh, I'll cut it off in just a second. For some reason, my iPad's uh, being argumentative. Right. I get it. I get it. So why don't you, yeah, Joel, take it away. Um, okay, so uh, uh, Janet and I just moved into our permanent house in Texas, so we're getting it fixed. I'm getting ready to uh, finish the Texas basement, better known as the attic. Uh, as soon as we sell our last house, it got a little off track with the, uh, uh, the virus. Uh, I will be continuing with doing uh, U.S. Military Railroad 1862, uh, late 1862, um, and uh, uh, Alexandria. Uh, Mark, I do have a good plan uh, from... Uh, the uh, roundhouse excavations city of Alexandria did maybe 20 years ago that has the 1862 uh, plan for Alexandria and the 1865 modifications. So there are two maps that were done by McCollum. Or McCollum had done that showed, his uh, showed what he got when he took the road over and uh, what he uh, ended with, what he added. Uh, I don't know if you had those or not. Uh, okay, so I'll, I got your email. I'll send it out. Um, the because uh, uh, they're well buried in the uh, uh, in the Alexandria historical collections, uh, which are always interesting. Um, so, so we're still working that. Uh, I hope to get up to see uh, Jerry sometime this year. <laughs> And, uh, and pick up Al's layout, which I will take and make into our traveling layout. Uh, so that whenever we do things uh, and, and need a public face, we'll have uh, the, uh, that excellent memorial available for, wow. for everybody to see. Perfect. I thank Jerry for saving that layout. Uh, this uh, 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 was a fantastic uh, thing to do. Uh, and uh, as far as uh, modeling goes right now, I'm at the one-to-one -one scale, uh, getting the rooms, uh, uh, getting my, uh, my what I really want in the room because right up now it's just raptors. <laughs> so, so I'm getting ready to get a contractor to come in and, uh, and lay that out. Uh, and uh, we'll invite everybody down. I've been surviving coronavirus uh, very well down here in Houston. Uh, pool's been open for the last uh, six weeks. Uh, and uh, we're 10 minutes from uh, uh, Houston uh, Intercontinental Airport. So if you're ever in the Houston area, you can come see me. And I found another Civil War modeler in Houston. No! At the, the NMRA is doing Zooms also. Right. And Lone Star. So I was talking and I showed a picture of the cars I think I posted last up, which has the... Uh, uh, has has one of the U.S. Military Railroad uh, livestock cars, and so I was showing some of those. And another guy brought out all these Civil War cars he was working on. So, Do you remember his name? Uh, yeah, I got it, and I don't have it. It's Sorry, right it's over in a place. No, uh, no. Uh, it's in my. It's in the the, re the record of that Zoom conference. <laughs> got it. That's great. Uh, that's it. Thanks, everybody. Tom. Thank you very much for doing this. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Uh, and I want to thank you for really taking on that project for uh, that memoriam to Al. I think that'll be, you know, a nice little cornerstone of our archive is to have that as a traveling memento. Beautiful. Thanks for doing that. And, and Mark and Jerry for your involvement. Jerry, your Herculean effort to get the damn thing out of the house. Um, David Borkman, what have you been doing? Oh, you're on mute, baby. There we go. Am I back on now? Yep. Uh, I have a modular railroad, Civil War railroad, that I take to train shows. 
around the southeast of the United States. It's Oak Age. I showed some pictures of it uh, meet in Memphis. Right. Um, one of the things that I'm interested in is animations, displays, that the public who comes to the show can essentially participate in the running of this model railroad. So my railroad is loosely based on a southern railroad up in North Carolina. Uh, if you let me do a screen share, I can show you two, three pictures pretty quick. Yeah, I think uh, I'll get out of there. You should be, yeah, you're good to go, yeah. Good to go, okay, let me make sure I can get this thing up, okay. So I hope some folks can see a cloud of smoke here. Oh, no, I don't. Oops, am I still here? I think I need to escape from the screen share. There we go. I can see some Zoom folks. I see Tom. Can you see a picture yeah. here? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So this is just an uh, example of an animation that I built where the cannon fires at the push of a button from somebody who's visiting the show. I just use toy soldiers to do this. Um, I'm a three rail low gauge guy and you know very well three rail low gauges don't care a whole heck of a lot about scale. And so just get the message across. Here's a cannon that fires. The cannon recoils and shoots out smoke with a big loud boom. Nice. Um, next thing, let's see. I'm interested in doing another, whoops, wrong way. Let's go backwards, still the wrong way. Let me get out of this thing here. Nice. Oops. I like it. Let me get back on, let's see, where am I? Well, I had it a minute ago. Let me stop the share for a minute ago. Sorry. The, Next thing I want to do is an animation of a cotton press. Uh-oh. Which is why I'm really interested in what Jerry has to say. So mule-powered cotton press, the idea being I can animate it so the mule goes round and go round in a circle and the press goes up and down. It should be an interesting challenge. That's great. That's a perfect setup, David. That's perfect. And so unfortunately, there is a uh, cotton press close by in Tarboro, and there's some plans for it on the internet if you want to look for one. Cool. Tarboro Cotton Press. So uh, this is perfect timing because I wanted to give you guys an option to do a liquid adjustment at this point. So I thought we could just take a five minute break, you know, fill right. up or empty, whatever you need to do. And then we'll uh, start back up with Mr. Dykstra. Can I ask a question? Sure. Okay. Um, I was looking online for images of the Grant Cottage in New York. Well, I just want to time out. Do you guys want to take a break or no? Better. You good? You're good to go? <coughs> if you need to break, you go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, DC. Okay. okay. If anybody, I've got two sides in the front, but online, you no matter what the search engine, I've not been able to see the third side or the fourth side. If anybody comes across and an image of that. I haven't been to the Library of Congress yet to see if Habs Hair has any uh, plans for it. But if anybody comes across an image of the back of the cottage, let me know, please. That was it. The back of the cottage, okay. Cool. Yeah, the Grant Cottage in New York. Right, right. So do you, do you guys, I don't, I don't sense a need to break. So you wanna just go right into Jerry's presentation? I don't make. Cool. Do it. Rock and roll. All right, Jerry, I am going to make an attempt here to do this. Holy mackerel. It was just there. Um, boop, 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 boop. Why don't you do a little bit of intro of yourself and yeah, well, uh, let's do that first. Give and then, stall uh, me out here. Then get into it. Go for it. Hello? Yep. Uh, most of you guys know who I am, but uh, I, I'm a locomotive nut, and that's kind of how I got into this. I uh, wanted to see some of the stuff that Al Mueller was doing and uh, came to the meeting in Chattanooga, met Chip, and uh, met Al, and we, Al kind of suggested that I might do a uh, Western and Atlantic Yona 
to fit on a man to a chassis. And uh, one thing led to another, we ended up doing the entire locomotive kind of from the ground up because doing it on a man to a chassis wasn't going to work. And uh, since then, I've been working on locomotives off and on. Uh, latest one is I'm working on uh, doing the general in in scale. And I was just about ready to order the parts up to get going on that, and Joel was kind of aware of that, but. Uh, I suddenly found myself without a job and uh, figured I wasn't going to buy the parts to build that thing until I uh, got reemployed. So shortly that should happen again. Uh, I've also been busy uh, doing some 3D digital modeling and 3D printing for Chris Kaonis, who owns Musket Miniatures. And I think uh, a lot of you guys are familiar with uh, Musket Miniatures. Uh, but uh, Chris recently purchased it, and he just recently also became a member of our group. So I've been working through uh, the 143rd scale uh, stuff, including the forge wagon, the limber, the caisson, and the battery wagon, in addition to the guns. Uh, I've also now got those done in 156th scale, and those are weird war gamer skills, I guess, is uh, now that I've got the 156 done, I'm going to uh, be going back into the O scale. And then there's some items he doesn't have yet in HO scale that we'll be cleaning up. So I think you can look at, uh, look forward to seeing musket miniatures come back on with a lot of Civil War stuff. <clears throat> so if any of you have any questions about that, uh, you know, just give me a holler, give me a shout, and I can let you know what's going on. So, in the meantime, I see Tom has kind of wandered off into the distance. <laughs> I'm back. There he is. <laughs> All right. So, you ready for this? Yeah. All right. I hope the computer, let me see where to go. I just had it. Do, 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 do. Um, there you are. Can you see that? Yeah, I can see it. Great. All right. So Cotton Ginning. So Jerry, do you want to you want to preface this with anything? Or you just tell me when yeah, to move I, uh, I want to preface it with a statement that I'm a Yankee and I'm not an expert on cotton. <laughs> <laughs> First time I saw a cotton field, uh, we've got a turkey processing plant down the road from us and uh, the turkeys that we eat don't grow like the wild ones. They grow with white feathers. And uh, when those turkey trucks go by the house, our front lawn's all covered with turkey feathers. And first time I saw a cotton field, I thought, son of a gun, somebody's just, somebody chased a flock of turkeys through a briar patch. And, uh, but it was a cotton field. So wow. anyway, uh, a while back, I had done uh, some engineering work for Mark Brainerd at Tennessee Valley Railroad Museum. Uh, they were going to build a full-size, one-to-one scale cotton car uh, based on some 1855 documents they had from the Western Atlantic Railroad. Uh, they had a, a list of material from the chief engineer, and that was all I had to work with. And Working with that, I was able to put together the design of a, uh, I guess you call it the pioneer period of railroading. Uh, it was a ladder frame post car <clears throat> with 24 inch end platforms on it. And one of the key things in doing that car was how big is a bale of cotton? Because the cars were meant to haul cotton. Uh, they were built by convicts uh, in Atlanta. And uh, when I started asking Mark about how big was a bale of cotton, it turned out nobody really knew. And uh, he said, well, he found a cotton box. And uh, I had no idea what a cotton box was, but apparently it was a box he thought they stuffed the cotton in to make a bale. Uh, turns out that the dimensions he gave me were uh, approximately 30 inches by 60 inches by probably 35 inches wide. 
Uh, if you take the 60 inch by 30 inch cotton bale, you can fit 15 of those in a layer in this car. And that car would carry two layers, which would then be about seven and a half tons, which was about the weight limit of that car. That's the one, Tom, that you've got a model of, I think. And, and LeBron built one, I think. LeBron's got one finished. So that, that car is designed to haul 30 bales that are approximately 30 by 60 by, uh, I'm thinking, 35. Now, <clears throat> as we get into the slides, uh, you'll see the, uh, the Carlton cotton press as well. So why don't we go ahead to the next slide. Oh, there we go. Okay, to, to understand the size of a bale, we had to understand the ginning process a little bit. But what you see here is a cotton gin, which is mule powered. And down in the lower level of that building, you can see a turnstile uh, with a couple of mules. And then there are speed increasing gears, which take the speed the mules are going around in the circle. And they wind it up to uh, a much higher speed to run the gin machine, which is on the upper floor. <clears throat> once, <clears throat> once the cotton is ginned, it's in a form that's it's it's no it's called uh, it's called lint. And what what comes out of the gin is kind of a a strip of cotton material that's kind of packed into uh, not really a blanket because it's real loose, but it's called lint. And that lint is then taken over to the press. You can see the man going up the stairs on the press with a load of something on his head. Well, that, that cotton was manually dumped into the presses, and then the, the mule hauled the screw around, turned the screw down to compress the cotton in the press. <clears throat> so why don't we go ahead and look at the next one, Tom. OK, here's another gin. Uh, you can just see the turntable down underneath if you look through those openings. Right here? Yeah. Yeah. And the bar down the lower part, that's the bar that the mules push. And the heavier looking thing up above it was the bowl gear that turned the other gearing. And I think that little building over to the left is probably the scale house because it, it always started at the scale. So let's go to the next one, Tom. That gentleman with a white beard sitting there under the sunshade could make or break your day. Uh, he's the guy, he was the waymaster, but the waymasters didn't just weigh the cotton. What they did, they graded the cotton as well. They would look at what's coming in and they would tell you how many cents per pound you were going to get, or cents per hundred, whichever way, but it was cotton was paid for by weight. So size of bale wasn't so important. It was how much weight was there. What they would do is they would bring the full wagon in and they, they would weigh the wagon with the load in it. And then once the wagon was empty, they would weigh the wagon again. And the difference would be the, the load of cotton that they were going to pay for. Uh, I've read one account where the, the guy who was the waymaster actually would grab a hunk of cotton and chew on it to tell you the grade of cotton that it was. Mm. And that doesn't sound like a fun job to me, but <laughs> apparently they were able to do it. So uh, what you see in the background on there, that big white building is the gym. Mm. And you can't really see where they would run the mule in that one, but uh, same principle. Mm -hmm. So let's go ahead to the next one. Looks like those mules could use a meal. Yeah. Okay, this is a drawing of a scale house. Uh, comes from the H A H E A R. Uh, uh, it's Library of Congress. They have a collection called the H E A R collection, which is historical architecture and engineering records. <clears throat> and there's a lot of good stuff in there. And uh, I was looking for cotton gins, and I came up with uh, the scale house. Wow. So here what you see is the, uh, you look at the lower right, which is a plan view of the thing. On the right hand side of that is the Scale. alleyway that the, that the wagon would roll through. Right. And that was actually the floor plate of the scale. 
And then the inside the building was the uh, readout from the scale. Actually, it would be where they slide the weights back and forth to, to weigh the cotton. Love it. Okay, go ahead. Next one. Uh, here's another gin. You can see some of the gearing hanging underneath. Can you see my cursor? Yes, I can. Okay, if you want me to point something out, you let me know. Yeah, okay. Uh, there's a lot of pictures of these small gins like this, which leads me to believe, unless somebody can prove otherwise, that gins were not centralized. They were maybe one plantation, maybe a couple of plantations as a co-op, but just like the farmer had a barn, the cotton farmer had a barn, and he had a gin. And uh, the gin machine itself wasn't real complicated. Mm. And everything, you know, you think of it being steam powered, but during the time of the Civil War, it was predominantly uh, horse powered or mule powered. So go ahead and shift to the next one. Yeah, one thing, an architectural thing I want to point out is <clears throat> these columns. It looks like they left enough meat on the beam to make it like its own footing. So were these, these were buried in the ground, do we know? Or these are probably just sitting on top of the ground, but it's attached to this, right? Yeah. Fascinating. They probably, they might have done that because if they had traffic, wagons and stuff coming around there, uh, ah. they had some meat to rub against if they were going to get hit. I was wondering if maybe the heaviest part of whatever they got on that second floor is over there. Interesting. Okay, cool. There you can see the bull gear uh, and the brown town gin. That uh, first colored picture of a gin was the brown town gin. And the bull gear turns these, uh, if you want to point at those smaller gears, Tom, these gears were all wooden. And the, the kind of construction of these gears is just like they used in Dutch windmills in the 1600s. Uh, the teeth on the bull gear, that's the big one, uh, they were all held in place with wedges. And then what they worked against on the small gear was those were just wooden dowels between two wooden plates. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and what you'd see there is the ratio of the big gear to the small gear is probably about eight to one. So right. when the mule went around eight times or one time, that gear would turn eight times. Right. And then if you look at the other side, you see a, a wheel there. That had a that had a that was on the same shaft or had a similar gear, and there was a wooden uh, a leather belt around that wheel that went up above and turned a much smaller pulley on the gin itself. Mm. So they could get probably a couple of hundred RPM on the gin by the mule going around maybe two times a minute. Wow, it looks like somebody was attempting to measure the height here. <clears throat> yeah, that was the, uh, this picture comes from that uh, H A E R record in the Library of Congress. Right. And during the Depression, they hired people to go out and uh, measure and record these old <sighs> buildings before they were torn down. Brilliant. So that was what was going on there. Thanks. And this so we're calling American engineering record. Yeah. This is again um, the drive portion of a gym. You can see the poles that the mules worked on. And again, you can see the speed increasing gearing and then the big pulley on the other end. And you can just see the belt going up above. And mm -hmm. that whole turning assembly is sitting on an iron pin. Um, Jeez. Socket. So it looks like a piece of rock. Wow. <clears throat> because the, the floor of this obviously was dirt. Right, right. Okay. It's another view of the same thing. And uh, you can see how it's the same kind of timber construction you would see, you know, here in Michigan, we've got a lot of barns that are built that way. And in my mind, it's the same guys that built barns would build these gyms. And right. Put the gearing together and then they would buy the machine you know, the gin machine was probably bought from some manufacturer in the Northeast. And uh, this one looks like it's got an iron band around the uh, 
bow gear around the main right gear. Right yeah. And uh, so it's a little, it may have been a little more recent. But again, uh, I think the gins were fairly localized. Uh, they were each built to their own design. And they really didn't get into using steam until probably the 1870s. All right. uh, go ahead again. Yeah, there you can see the, the pulley that's driving the belt that's going up above. This particular building had spaces on, on each end of it. Uh, on, on one end, it looked like it was probably stairway 